Welcome back to Lunchtime Babbling. So uh, this has been a crazy week in uh, AI policy and for AI ethics and AI governance in general. Um, I just got back from uh, DC. Uh, I attended a conference there called uh, uh, AI Law, uh, Ethics and Compliance. And so uh, I gave a workshop uh, essentially on all things sort of AI well, first it was basically what is AI, and then going through uh, what are the risks associated with AI, what are the ways you can test uh, for those risks, what are the right kind of governance frameworks you might want to have in place. Um, and this was put on by the, the DC Bar Association. It was a really great conference, uh, met a lot of really great people, um, and got a, really got a, the perspective of uh, general counsel, and other lawyers um, working in with in, with corporations uh, or outside counsel on how they perceive AI risk, what they're recommending, and a lot of insight into where, how companies are using AI. Because there are a lot of there were a lot of general counsel within uh, different industries that were speaking um, financial services um, and, and others, and so that was that was really exciting. However, it was totally overshadowed, uh, and it was nice to be in D.C. when this happened, overshadowed by, of course, the executive order that was announced on Monday. And I'm not going to get into the executive order uh, at, at right now because I think it deserves um, an entire probably hour of going through the executive order. Um, but it's it really is a, a huge shift in, I think, uh, the U.S.'s stance on responsible AI. I think if you were to, you know, uh, ask me two weeks ago, what, what region is, is leading on AI regulation, I would say, would have said Europe. And I think the EU AI Act is, it's in the trilogue process right now. Uh, there are a lot of struggles, you know, hopefully they can get it done um, by the end of the year, or potentially, I think they have an opportunity in February, if not. Um, because the EUA Act is, is just a, a more comprehensive look at a uh, framework for addressing these sorts of risks. However, the executive order was, uh, was, is really comprehensive. And the difference, of course, is that it applies, it has a, a whole bunch of mandates about, uh, about what the government is going, planning to do about AI, both in terms of trying to encourage um, the use of AI within government and to develop the U.S.'s capabilities in AI and, and to really uh, secure our leadership. It also talked a lot about making sure that that AI uh, was safe and ethical and, and is going to protect people. And so there are a huge number of uh, requirements that got laid out for, uh, for almost every single federal agency. And so we're going to see, I think, in the next month or so, and they had very little time to actually implement a lot of these things. We're going to see the federal agencies really scrambling to implement uh, parts of this executive order. NIST plays a really big role in this executive order. Uh, as I've talked about in this podcast before, NIST has come up with an AI risk management framework, which is very, uh, which is very high level, but also, I mean, d detailed and, and quite comprehensive at the same time. Uh, and there are a lot of, they're doing a lot of work um, sort of in individual industries and, and trying to come up with what they call profiles for uh, specific types of systems and in specific types of industries. But this executive order is really pushing them uh, to really come up with the standards for what we, what we consider uh, safe deployment of AI. And so this is a very exciting time. Now, of course, that wasn't the only thing. Uh, there was the, the AI Safety Summit in the UK and a big agreement there among um, sort of all parties attending to uh, do the same, to really support this agenda for making AI safe. Uh, and then there's also the G7 uh, released AI governance guidelines. And so this, is, this has been a crazy week for... Uh, AI governance, responsible AI, uh, and and this this is going to have huge ramifications in the coming months. And so I think every every company, uh, every federal contractor, 
is needs to be paying attention to this because there's going to be requirements that are going to get passed down to federal contractors. Every federal agency has to worry about this. And I think there are aspects of this that are going to get pushed out into the private sector. It's not going to be isolated. Um, and, and there are some specific requirements around people that work or develop foundational models. Uh, companies like OpenAI and Anthropic are going to have to have new requirements for testing and red teaming these systems before they get released into the wild. And so this was uh, a super exciting um, week. And I think uh, I, I'll need time to digest everything that happens. Um, so I'll definitely talk more about this uh, in coming uh, lunchtime babbling. I do want to take a, a second to, to reflect on some of the things that uh, I've heard during the, the conference w with what industry is doing. And it was very clear that generative AI, which maybe is not surprising, but generative AI really has uh, come to the forefront in companies. And companies are really struggling. Well, they're, they're struggling, but they're also r rushing to implement uh, generative AI, and in particular things like large language models, into their systems. And this is something that's happening sort of at the board level. They're talking about this. And uh, there are so many efficiencies that I think that they see that they could gain. But there are, are also a lot of problems. And so what struck me is that... Uh, all of the all of the general counsel there sort of unanimously said that the that they had to act very quickly. For instance, to come up with an AI policy, like what is the policy around the use of generative AI? And the, the part of the problem is, it's so tempting for workers to to just go uh, and start using generative AI on their own. You know, they have they have busy work. They need to summarize documents. They need to produce documents, produce slides, all of this. And the real worry, of course, and justified worry, is that a lot of these systems are what they called open, which I don't like that term because uh, an open system uh, sounds like open source. It's not what they're actually talking about these proprietary systems that uh, are open in the sense that the data that you put into it can be accessed by the vendor on the other side. And so, um, the, the, the real struggle was scrambling to come up with policies uh, and figuring out who can use it and when and under what circumstances because of the problems with leaking uh, sensitive information, uh, trade secrets, um, information about clients, personal identifiable information into the large language models and outside of their control. And so this is a non-trivial problem. There are privacy professionals at this conference worried about this for good reason. Um, the other problem, of course, is, is copyright, because I think there's some precedent now, and we'll see sort of how this, how this progresses, that material generated by these generative AI uh, can't be copyrighted. Um, and so the, or at least it, it's uncertain enough that the worry is, what happens when I start producing things that I want to be copyrighted using generative AI? Is that a risk? The answer is yes. And I think the, the unanimous answer among the general counsel that I talked to and that were at the conference is that yes, this is a severe risk. And um, the policy should be, until we know more, do not create anything that you want to have protected under uh, copyright law or trademark uh, or or you want that intellectual property, um, do not create it with, with uh, generative AI because you can't be guaranteed that that's something that you can protect. Someone can take it and just use it if, it, if it, they find out that it was created. And so this is the struggle. This is one of the big struggles that's happening right now in organizations and across industries um, is figuring out what are they going to do with generative AI and what are the policies. And so um, that's really interesting, and it's a, and it's a hard hard struggle. And I think a lot of the policies have been just don't use it. And so a lot of organizations have just shut it down. It's too risky. Um, you can't have access to it with any any kind of client data or any products that you create. You can go home and use it on your own for fun, but when you're working uh, and for any kind of work products, generative AI is not usable. And so this is this limits, of course, the value, uh, how valuable it is. 
and uh, and it probably is going to necessitate a lot of uh, careful thinking about how do we get on-premises systems when we're talking about protecting IP and then sorting out um, what kind of uh, modifications of the outputs have to happen in order for us to feel confident that we can retain the IP when we produce things with generative AI. All right, uh, so that's it for, for this week. I'll come back with a lot more. It's, I just figured I'd jump on and uh, share this. Um, please, uh, you know, if you enjoy this, like and subscribe. We're going to be putting this out uh, 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 regularly. And uh, I'll talk to you later on Lunchtime Babbling.